But we also know we're praying for folks across the world. We're ca casting these to you for the, the folks in Ukraine and Russia and the war that's going on there, Lord. And we ask that your name will be glorified in that. We ask for relief. We ask for peace in that warfare. But Lord, there's also another warfare that's going on beyond what we can see. And that's a spiritual warfare all around us and in our lives even. And we pray, Father, that our eyes would be open to see you and to trust you and to call on you and to live by faith as light in a dark world that does not know you. Lord, thank you that you're the one that opened the eyes of our understanding to, to, see, to hear the gospel and respond to the gospel and come to know Christ for everyone in here that, that is saved. And yet, Lord, now we live among so many folks who are seeing life and interpreting life through a dark cave, and they don't, cannot see what's outside of that cave. The reality of a Savior, the reality of uh, truth. And I pray that you help us to be ambassadors of the gospel, to share the love of Jesus with those around us as individuals and as a church. And Lord, may you continue to work in this church. Thank you so much for how we've seen you work already in 2022, what you're doing. And Lord, we know that there's so much that we can't see. We can trust what you're doing, that you bring fruit um, when we abide in you and we follow you and worship you. So thank you, Lord, for what you're doing. As we open up the, the word again today, Lord, as we open up into Daniel 3, continue to speak to our hearts uh, for our, 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 the deepening of our faith the maturing of our, our walk with you, Lord, but also for the glory, ultimately for your glory in our lives and in this community and in this world. And I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, thank you so much for continuing to, to pray. We are going to jump right back into Daniel 3, where we left off last time. Um, Daniel 3, verse 19 is where we're going to be here in just a moment. I want to do a quick little summary to catch us up in case you weren't here last time and have not been able to get there. Um, it's not going to be labor, but I do want you to know, Daniel 3, we can almost put this into three different scenes of a story, three different scenes of a, a historical narrative that took place here. Uh, the first scene was the statue. And if you were with us, if you read Daniel 3 before, actually, if you heard this, probably one of the first Bible stories you may have heard as a child about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego not bowing down to this great statue and, um, and how God blessed through that. So scene one, I would call it the statue. And that's where Nebuchadnezzar made a massive statue, 90 feet tall and, and, and nine feet wide. And that was to be bowed down to when the musicians uh, played. We did mention, you know, where was Daniel in this? We don't see him. His name's not mentioned in this account. But we do know based on Daniel's history of faith, we can be confident that Daniel was not bowing down to that idol. He Earlier on, he said, you know, I will... I, I purposed in my heart not to defile myself with the king's food so we can be confident that he didn't defile his, his, his heart by bowing down before a false idol as well. And then the, the musicians played and there were some folks that um, bowed down. In fact, it says everybody bowed down, but there were three who did not. <laughs> and that was Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And that's what brought us to scene two, the conflict. Scene two, the conflict. And that was in, divided in two parts. And we made it through part A last week of scene two, the conflict. And that's where the Chaldeans came to the king and made accusations against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and said, King, they're not bowing down. And so they were brought before the king. And um, he gave them an opportunity to, to, to bow down to the uh, fight, false idol, to the statue. Because that's what the enemy does. That's what Satan does, by the way. He's... He's, he's not opposed to giving you multiple opportunities <laughs> to bow down and worship a false idol, bow down and, and turn away from God, bow down and give in to temptation and make that a part of your life. And so the enemy did that at, here as well. Um, and they responded to the king. Does anybody remember how they responded? What did they say? In your own words, what did they say? Yeah, God, we believe God will save us. We don't need to answer you, King. We believe God will save us. But even if he doesn't, we're not going to bow down. And what a great um, example of faith being in the person of God and not faith being simply in the outcome. 
God, never, God promises so much about himself, and he does promise the outcome, but sometimes we can say, well, because God promised that there, this is what it means here. And the outcome here may not be what God intended by that promise. It's something greater than that, just like healing. There's like folks that preach and teach today, if you have enough faith, you will be healed of any physical disease or ailment on this earth. And we know that's not true. You will be healed if you have faith in Christ. You will be healed, but the healing may not come. Physical healing may not come until you're with the Lord. And you and I both know folks who we've prayed for their healing and they received it when they went to heaven. When they walked through the doorway of death and there they were before the Lord. And they're healed of everything. And God is faithful to his word. He's always faithful. It doesn't mean we can't pray for outcomes. Or have hope like Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego did for outcomes. We believe that God will deliver us. But even if he doesn't, we're still not going to bow down. Their faith was not um, dictated by their circumstances or, or by the outcome. They were going to trust in the Lord in that. So today we're getting to verse 19 right now. This is part B of scene two. It's part B of the conflict. So read with me in verse 19. You can imagine already. You can picture this. I look, this Daniel's very picturesque. And picture Nebuchadnezzar as you read this, what his face must have even looked like. Verse 19, then Nebuchadnezzar was filled with rage, and the expression on his face changed <laughs> towards Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He gave orders to heat the furnace seven times hot or more than was customary. And he commanded some of, his be of the best soldiers in his army to tie up. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and throw them into the furnace of blazing fire. So these men, in their trousers, their robes, their head coverings, and other clothes, they were tied up and thrown into the furnace of blazing fire. Since the king's command was so urgent, and the furnace extremely hot, the raging flames killed those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego fell, bound into the furnace of blazing fire. I don't know which was hotter, this furnace or the king. <laughs> he, he was filled with rage. And it's interesting that Daniel, when he writes this, is that his expression changed towards these foes. He wouldn't even have said that. We would have known this just by the rage that he felt. But there was so much going on here inside of um, King Nebuchadnezzar that he was filled with rage that came through the outside. He had less control. This is the most powerful man on the earth. He had less control of his own emotions than he did anything else. And he let this rage just take him over. And um, there's a scripture passage in Proverbs 14, 29 that speaks to this. It says, a patient person, person shows great understanding, but a quick-tempered one promotes foolishness. And we can see... Um, and there were times when Nebuchadnezzar was very impulsive and allowed his, his rage or whatever emotion was at the moment to, to dictate his response in that. Seven times more, um, that's a hot fire. Now, it was literally seven times. Seven times, it may have been a figurative way of saying this was the hottest fire they've ever had. It was more hot. I, I did look it up. How hot is a fire? Does anybody know how hot a fire is? I didn't know. I knew it was hot. <laughs> I'm sure you had some experiences of being too close to a flame. You're like, well, yeah, that's, that's hot. What I learned was fire is either 1,200 degrees up to 3,000 degrees, and that's a blue flame. You ever seen a blue flame? I don't know if I would tell the difference. So if I pack my hand in a yellow flame or a blue flame, I know it's hot. But this said 1,200 to 3,000 degrees, so seven times that would be 7,000 to 21,000 degrees. May very well have been what we do know his fire was so hot that it killed the soldiers, killed those that were throwing Shadrach, Beshach, and Abednego into the flames. <laughs> so Proverbs was right. <laughs> uh, uh, the losing his temper is always the mark of a little, little person, little man. Yeah. But seven times, that would have been a benefit to Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego if, if the God had not intervened because... They'd been vaporized as soon as they got close. Mm -hmm. They wouldn't have felt a thing. Mm -hmm. If he wanted, if he wanted to torture oh, us, suffering. he'd have made it lower. Right. Where they would gradually have experienced the that pain of torture. But seven times, 
<laughs> They'd be gone in an instant. Yeah. Nothing. That makes sense. And it's, isn't that the way that, that rage and impulsivity works? We, we, we lose the capability of thinking through things. I've got to do this right now. Arr! And um, <laughs> patience is more than a virtue. <laughs> Not that Nebuchadnezzar, that you know, we would expect him to be patient just because of the way we've seen him respond in the past. But there's more going on in Nebuchadnezzar than over time. There's more going on in his heart that you're going to continue to read about, um, even in the next chapter. And um, it's, it's interesting to see Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 3 and Nebuchadnezzar in chapter 4 at the beginning and then Nebuchadnezzar by the end of chapter 4. But here we see a very impulsive, rage-filled man who did something, you're right, that, that really went against what maybe he may have been trying to do to cause suffering, cause something that hot, would, the suffering would have been instantaneous. But when God's there, there was no suffering for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego at that point. They, 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 when you see how they came out, they didn't even smell like smoke. I just gave a little spoiler, but you already know. They didn't even smell like smoke. Um, so the suffering was not a part of that experience at that moment. So this brings us to scene three, the final scene of this chapter. Daniel um, 20, uh, 3, 24 through 30, let's go there. Let's see what happens. They're thrown into the fire, right? And then all of a sudden, in verse 24... Then King Nebuchadnezzar jumped up in alarm. He's just having a, a mountain valley day. <laughs> um, he jumped up in alarm. And he said to his advisors, didn't we throw three men bound into the fire? Yes, of course, your majesty. They replied to the king. And verse 25, he exclaimed, look, I see four men not tied walking around in the fire unharmed. And the fourth looks like a son of the gods. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the door of the furnace. That was brave to approach that door, that hot fire. He approached the door of the furnace in a blazing fire and called, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, you servants of the most high God, come out. That's got to be the first time someone tried to call somebody out of a fire. Come out. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire. Verse 27, when the satraps, the prefects, the governors, and the king's advisors gathered around, they saw that the fire had no effect on the bodies of these men. Not a hair of their heads was singed. Their robes were unaffected, and there was no smell of fire on them. That's amazing, isn't it? Charles Spurgeon writes this. He says, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego lost something in that fire. Not their coats. Not one hair on their heads. The fire did not hurt them, but it snapped their bonds. They went in bound, and they came out unbound. They walked out on their own. And then Charles says, what a blessed loss. <laughs> a true Christian's losses are gains in another shape, is what he says. Many of God's servants never know the fullness of spiritual liberty until they are cast into the midst of the furnace. Maybe you've been through a difficult time, and through it, the Lord gave you a greater understanding of who he is and, and magnified your faith in him. And this, this, this is a great example in these three men, these Jewish men, that God delivered them, and the, what they lost was that which bound them by the king. And, and they came out. I'm curious about this, like a son of the gods um, that King, King Nebuchadnezzar said, by using the comparison of the word like, the king was saying that there was something different, something even divine about this fourth figure. And so that led to the question on your study guide, question number three. There was a fourth man in the fire with Shadrach, Bishat, and Abednego. Who was this person, or who is this person, and what does this presence, what is the presence of this person Teach us about God. So in your own study, what have, you, what have you decided or come up with or what's some insight into who this, this fourth person is? It reminded you that God's with you in every situation. And it's interesting that King saw this fourth person, but the Lord's with us whether we see him or not. We know that he's with us. That tells us something about God. That's true. That's good. Could have been an angel. 
That's right. Could very well have been an angel. The Lord has shown up, up and prior to this many times and spoken through an angel. Oh, his spirit. His spirit. The spirit? Yes, which sometimes appears in, in the Old Testament as a person. Yes, he does. And there's a word for this. Um, actually, it's, there's a Christophany is that Jesus himself shows up in the old times as, um, as a person or as an angel even that is actually pointing to, to Christ himself. A pre-existent Christ, or not pre-existent, but pre-incarnate Christ. Jesus is pre-existent. <laughs> Where did you use? Christophany. I've heard it called theophany. Or theophany, that's God, same thing, God or, or Christ. Theophany, it is God. We know the Lord is in that. 580 years before his virgin birth. Before his birth. He made himself known. Yep. In the Old Testament. That's right, in the Old Testament. Uh, 580 years before he was, he was born as a baby. So some people think. That's what he, some people he, think. He was God, not like a God. He was God. That's right. But you were looking for Nebuchadnezzar's perception through his worldview lenses. He's like a God. One of the gods. And it very well may have been God himself. What we do know, this, this fourth man in the fire was from the Lord. I can't dogmatically say it was Jesus. Now, you may, you may land there, and I'm not going to argue with you. I think it was Christ pre-incarnate. I think it was. But what I do know is that, as, as Margaret said, that God is with us through everything that we face. That's one of the things it tells us about, teaches us about God. And, and, and some of you know this. There were there are moments you've been through the fire and you may not have been able to see God or even tell that He is with you based on circumstances. But His faithfulness is independent of circumstances. He's transcendent above all circumstances. His faithfulness is based on His character. And He said, I will never leave you. I'll never forsake you. And He's always there. The hardest time to try to figure out God is often in the middle of bad circumstances. I believe it's Henry Blackaby that said, whenever we go through those terrible circumstances, that that's the time we have to lean on what we do know about God, not try to figure out God. Just trust what we know, that he's good and that he's faithful. Understanding may come afterwards. It may not. But it doesn't mean he's not good and faithful. We can trust in him even when circumstances say he's not here. He really is. These three Hebrew children, Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, experienced the promise that Isaiah made 130 years before. In Isaiah chapter 43, verses 1 through 3. And I saw this for, when I was at... Uh, in this, at uh, the Animal Kingdom in Disney World, yeah. I saw a group of people wearing these on the back of the shirt that had these verses. I'll read this for you. It's a very familiar verse. He says, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by your name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you will, shall not be burned, nor the flame scorch you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. How about that? And that was written over 100 years before this. That's great. But figuratively, we, like you said, we go through things every day. I mean, people go through things. Sure. To the fire. That's right. Just look around. And God's faithful. We hear stories of people who are in a difficult situation and they just a person or situation shows up and when the person talks about it later, they say, I never saw that person come to me. I never saw the person leave me. But it was a human being yes. in human form yeah. that came to help me. And lots of, you can read lots of stories about that. There's probably lots of stories in here yeah, about that, that as well. I, I know that was God. They just knew in their yeah. heart, you know, that that was who it was. That's it. That's exactly right. <clears throat> he, heard it. He's good. I've heard it often said that if you're not going through something, you will. Yeah. <laughs> you're either going through it, it. That's right. You're going through it now. Or you're not going through something. You're. Yes, right. You have been. You're on the. Or you're going through it, or you're on the way. 
This is just such an imperfect world. This is part of, I guess, the curse. Yeah. It started all the way in Genesis. It's just amazing how the Bible goes through. And yet the Lord, and the Lord's in the heart of every bit of this. There was a time years ago, and some of y'all gonna remember this, when um, our youngest son Caleb, he had a massive seizure, and it happened one Friday night. I was here with some students, uh, doing, watching a movie, and Sherry took Caleb to go to Target, and he started having. Um, he had been having some migraines. I'm going to spare you the details. I'm going to let you know, he had this huge seizure. And she called me and said, you, you need to come to Target here at White Oak. And so I took off and got there. And what I walked in on was Caleb's on the floor. He's unconscious. He's bl almost blue. And the EMS is with him in there and have a bag breathing for him. And I'm, I don't know everything that's going on. I just know I'm, I'm over him. Did I share this with you recently? No. Okay. He's, Caleb's doing great, by the way. If you don't know, this, the end of the story is still it's, it's great. But at that moment, we didn't know what the end of the story was. It was terrifying. And later, I heard from Sherry what had happened was she, Caleb had come up to her, and he had been having these weird things happen with vi visual stuff. And he said, Mom, it's happening again. And so she took him to the restroom. He got sick. On the way out, she said that she could tell he was looking straight ahead and talking to her some, but he wouldn't. He was starting to lose um, his mental faculty some, and he started turning his head to the right and staying that way, which is an indication of a seizure, and then he just went into a full-blown seizure. And she called for help out loud in front of in Target, and the pharmacist called 911, and they came, and she said all of a sudden there was somebody patting her shoulder, And it was, a, it was a lady, and the lady was saying, it's okay, Mom. He's going to be okay. He's going to be okay. And when I got there, there's Caleb on the floor with the EMS. He's, I described him. Sherry's sitting on a bench while they're working on him, and there's a lady next to him, and I can picture her, and her hand's on Sherry's shoulder, um, I, after all this was said and done, uh, we ended up going to the hospital that night. There's so much more I'd love to tell you. But the Lord, the Lord kept Caleb alive that night. And I thought I recognized that lady from someone at the gym. I've never talked with this lady. I've just seen this lady at the gym, I thought. And so... Uh, a couple of weeks later, I went to the gym, and she was on a treadmill. And y'all, it's kind of weird to walk up to a female at a gym because of the bad stories. But I thought, I'm, I'm going to do this. And I went up to her, and I said, you don't know me, but I need to ask you something. Were you at Target a couple of weeks ago, and there was a little guy having a seizure, and you comforted the mother? And she said, no. I said, I am so sorry then, because... Whatever lady that was, she looked like you. <laughs> and, and, and so I, I didn't want to be creepy. So I said, thank you. Have a blessed day. <laughs> and I don't know who that was. Um, Sherry called back Target to see if someone left a name or something. And I don't know. It may have, been, may have been a friend of yours or a family member of yours. Or it may have been an angel. Or whatever it was, we know the Lord sent that person to comfort a mother and God is so good. God is just so good. You've been that source of comfort, I bet, in someone's life. And you can be. The Lord can use you through a word of encouragement. If you have a prompting to share a word of encouragement with somebody, please don't talk yourself out of it. Think, nah, they don't want to hear that. It probably ain't going to mean anything. The Lord has blessed his body of Christ with each other. And we have a responsibility, just as we learned back in Colossians. We have a responsibility to each other, to encourage each other with the word and with spiritual songs and hymns and praises. Don't discount what God wants to do through you. That's not the main point of this fourth man in the fire, but it is a truth about God and about you, God in you. Let me finish. I know we're going to run out of time here in just a moment. Let's, let's, um, I, do, I do want to say this. There's different commentaries that say this could have been the pre-incarnate Christ. Some people who study the, the Bible so much, I, I have a lot of respect for people that have incredible insights into God's Word. 
some of those say this could have been pre-incarnate Christ, and some of those say it was pre-incarnate Christ. People I respect, John MacArthur, Charles Ryrie say, well, it could have been pre-incarnate Christ. H.B. Ironside and Warren Wearsby, it was incarnate Christ. Ultimately, God did this. <laughs> it's for his glory. I'm not going to land here and do a losing sleep over. Was this Jesus? Was it not? I've seen, you know, I've seen a song too. The old Southern Gospel song, The Fourth Man in the Fire. You know, when talking about it being Christ. I do know it was, it was the Lord um, it, behind every bit of that. And Nebuchadnezzar saw this with his eyes. <laughs> There's somebody in the fire like a son of the gods. And it may well, very well been um, an accidental prophecy on his part that it actually was a son of God. Or an accidental insight, I should say. Let's look at the last few verses here in Daniel 3, 28 through 30. Once they came out, they don't smell like smoke or anything. That's amazing. He called them out, they came out, and then verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar exclaimed, Praise to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Praise to their, their God. He recognizes their God. He's saying this is the most high God. It's not saying he doesn't believe there's other gods, but he's starting to acknowledge this is the most high God. He says he sent his angel and rescued his servants who trusted in him. They violated the king's command and risked their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Therefore, <laughs> I issue a decree that anyone of any people, nation, or language who says anything offensive against the god of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be torn limb from limb and his house made a garbage dump. <laughs> here comes that, that, the instant impulsivity over the top response here of what's going to happen to you if, you if you say anything offensive about their god. For there is no other God who is able to deliver like this. And then the king rewarded Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Now, they ended up being rewarded by the king. Was that their motive? <laughs> Not at all. Not at all. Their reward was in the one that they knew as Yahweh, Jehovah God, the Most High God. They weren't looking for any reward. But look at what God did when they stood for him. And they said, we're not going to bow down to this idol. This is a challenge and um, an encouragement, an exhortation, really, for us to consider who is it that we worship? Do we worship the one true God, the most high God, who is the only God, and there's no other God? Or do we worship the one true God but live like he's one of many? Because we have other things that can become gods in our lives. And there's only one that's worthy of your worship and mine. Every bit of it, isn't there? And it's, it's God Almighty. It's Jesus. It's God as he's revealed himself as Father, Son, and Spirit. And he is worthy of every bit of this. So we have this example before us in one of the many places in Scripture that their steadfast faith can be an encouragement to us in a world that seems like it's turning more and more into Babylon every day, you and I have reason to be faithful to the Lord. And it has nothing to do with the direction of this world. It has everything to do with Jesus Christ and who he is. And so you love him, live for him, point to him, and be a light. I can't wait, y'all. I'm the end of April. I get to preach again. And actually, I'm preaching this Sunday, but I'm preaching Travis's message. Um, <laughs> he sent me his notes. And uh, so I'm going I'm to, it's hard to preach off somebody else's notes. So I'm going I'm to study God's word with his notes. But we're going to use that same outline. But there's a message I look forward to preach at the end of April when we're talking about Christ, reconnecting to Christ in this community, or reconnecting to the community um, as Christians. And it, I hadn't even thought about it, how it connects to here. But Jesus is the light. And Jesus says, you are the light. We have a great way to radiate the love of Christ to a world when we stand for Christ, no matter what the world's doing. So be encouraged with that. Anything you want to add before I close us in prayer today? Uh, just an observation that when Nebuchadnezzar made this decree, everybody bowed down, but Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego stood up. Fast forward to chapter 6. Everybody else is standing up. And who is it that's going to have? Right. That's 
I can't imagine. So it's the flip side, you know? That's right. Any way you want to look at it, it works every way. That's, thank you for that. Look how many lives. This is <coughs> his first story. Yes. It, it makes you know the importance of our witness. Uh, it does. And the importance of teaching, teaching God's word to our children. Oh, that's right. Importance of our witness. Yeah. Where was Daniel at this time? I'm sorry? Where was Daniel at this time? It doesn't say where Daniel was in this particular chapter. That we, there is a possibility that Daniel was sent at, on, on service for somewhere else for, for the king. He served the king. And so he may not even have been you know, right there where this was happening. He may have been out of town. But the scripture doesn't tell us where he was. He could have been out of town. He could have been out of town. That's right. <laughs> but we know where he was. Yeah. <laughs> but I like that, Lord. That's why I said out of town. <laughs> it was a good time to be out of town, though. Okay. <laughs> but we do know where he was. But no, it doesn't tell us where he was. That's a good question, though. I know there's a lot of questions we'll find out answers to when we get to heaven. Yeah. Yeah. If we care about it at a moment, we're in front of King himself. Did I hear somebody else? Or are you trying to sing a song? <laughs> Let me pray for us. Father, you are faithful. All the time. And you're good today, on good all the time. May we, Lord, have faith in you that no matter what comes our way this day, that we know our God is holy and is worthy of all of our worship and praise and worthy of all of our lives. And Lord, may we love you with all of our hearts and all of our soul and all of our might and all that we are. And may that love for you translate in us to proclaiming the gospel and proclaiming living in your love to those around us today, whether it's someone we are in our family or someone that we come across with in daily dealings. Lord, may we love them with the gospel love. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Y'all have a great week, and thank you so much for praying for, for these needs over the next week. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much. Thank you.